by creed, until it is of age or reunited with its own kind, you are a clan too. It is a time of uncertainty. For now, the child is safe, and he and the Mandalorian must search the galaxy for answers. But with few allies, danger lurks everywhere. And there's one enemy that will stop at nothing for the child's recapture. Join Cyber Ren and Dee Vizsla as they track the adventures of the Clan of Two. Wherever I go, he goes. This is the Mandalore Podcast. This is the way. Welcome to The Mandalore, the definitive podcast for The Mandalorian. We are now well on our way, this is the way, into this main mission of Season 2, but not without a few side quests. First, I am the cowering behind my blanket, Cyber Ren. And I am... <laughs> and I'm the what happened to Boba D. Vizsla. <laughs> <laughs> you almost want to swear in there, don't you? Yes. I almost did. <laughs> <laughs> What's a Star Wars swear word? There's got to be one that they use. Oh, the... well, Poodoo is one. Okay. <laughs> you can kind of guess what that is, I think. Yeah, yeah. You know, R R two, your favorite, R2 has some swear words, but they're beeps. Yeah, and you probably don't know what he's saying, but no. he's swearing at you when you don't realize it. <laughs> awesome. Well, welcome to the show, everybody. It is episode two called The Passenger, chapter 10. Let's get into some news before we talk about the episode. All right, you got a few things here for us, some exciting things. Yes, uh, very exciting. Um, again, not none of this stuff is confirmed from Lucasfilm. Ooh, so they okay. are kind of in the rumor mill, but there are some outlets that mm -hmm. are reporting uh, some of this news right now. One that we've talked about last week, which is season three does begin filming apparently in about three weeks. Nice. First of December. But with that, we have a casting rumor that has hit the waves, and that is uh, of a woman named Sophie Thatcher. Okay, I don't recognize the name. I don't recognize the name either. She has She did a movie with Pedro Pascal, though, so that's why they're thinking there's some connection there that, you know, she got wind, she got wind of some casting director. Um, and hmm. Some on-screen chemistry, maybe. Right. And uh, yeah. so she is re reportedly given a role in season three of The Mandalorian. Nice. No, had no idea the significance or the size, but she apparently is in season three. Now, this is where it kind of takes a little bit of a turn because... She has, it's also been reported that she has been cast in a spinoff series huh. for Disney Plus. And this spinoff series apparently has been in development. And, the, and what it's rumored now to be is a limited series around Boba Fett. Oh, I saw those rumors that Disney's working on a possible Boba Fett spinoff. So she's going to come in make her first appearance on The Mandalorian and might be around for a couple episodes, but then she leaves to join Boba Fett in his own series. It, or is it a separate series, like not at this on the same timeline? So so here, so here, the rumor is, again, the rumor is what's being reported is that the spinoff series has been in development around Boba Fett, which obviously is going to be Tamar Morrison. And apparently they've known about this. So hmm. the thing about it is, is again, the rumor, and I hope this is true, but so it's a limited series. It's not a seasonal series. So it's probably only going to be three or four episodes again. Yeah. But what they're hearing is that this series, this actually starts shooting next week. <laughs> oh, wow. And it's going to be released prior to season three. Meaning that she could show Sophie could show up in that series first, and then make uh -huh. her way to season three of Mandalorian. So, okay. Uh, so the so again, she's cast. The rumor the 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 rumors right now are around her being cast. So she could have gotten casted for the series that they're shooting, getting ready to shoot now, and then we'll make her way over to season three once that gets started 
in a couple of weeks. Yeah. But, you know, a limited series like this probably is only, you know, going to be in uh, production for maybe a month or two, if that. Hmm. So Now, the only thing about rumors like this is that it, it kind of gives away a, a bit about Boba Fett. Maybe we, we can talk about that when we get in the episode, but it, it, it tells us that he is here to stay, that he's going to have some significance in this season, enough to give him a spinoff series. So it, it does kind of open the door to letting us know what might be coming, which is maybe like bordering on spoilering a little bit. Well, see, I think I, I'm actually leaning more towards that he actually doesn't show up in The Mandalorian anymore. Ah, well, hang on to those thoughts because we'll get to that yep. coming up in our in our show. But yeah, I, I'll, I'll be curious as to why you think that now after what everything we speculated on to begin with. Right. <laughs> cool. So anyway, that's that's the big news. Yeah. Well, at least there's a little bit. At least some stuff keeps trickling in and probably will all season long. And we just want to ask you guys, continue spreading the word about our show if you enjoy it after watching Mandalorian and listening to us. Just let everybody know that's the best way to help the show grow. And then to also check out our Patreon page, patreon.com slash the Mandalore podcast, where you can help support the show if you do enjoy it enough to do so. We totally appreciate that. Let's get into this discussion. This is the way. All right. Overall impressions and ratings. Now, this one took me a little bit to think of because me and Vizsla were talking behind the scenes a little bit and we kind of began on quite opposite ends of the spectrum, I think. And it seems like we're maybe meeting in the middle a little bit after a couple of viewings. So we'll have to see. We'll have to see depending on what we both say here. <laughs> Let's see where we're at. So I'm giving this one a seven things I would never eat. Mm -hmm. Baby Yoda, enough with the eating growth stuff. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think I may have reacted to this one differently than what I believe is sounding like the overall reaction from, from what I hear from Vizsla, from what I hear from some fans. I don't know. Upon the first viewing is what I'm talking about. After subsequent watches, I do see what I'm sure we're going to get into that can be summed up as disappointments, letdowns maybe. Is that cryptic enough for you? As always, we're here to give you the honest synopsis driven by our passion for Star Wars. And I'm going to say this first. I enjoyed this one a lot. The first time through, I really enjoyed it. I watched it on my phone with my headphones at work during lunch, and it creeped the hell out of me. There was a whole lot of, oh crap, they're in trouble now type reactions. But then on the second time and on the third time, my mind started remembering all of our theories, all of our hopes, all of our questions, which I then laid those onto this episode's template. And that's where the aforementioned disappointments showed themselves. And really, it's not what they showed us that's let down, it's the lack of showing us anything of relevance. And in such a short season, when they have so much ground to cover, if all the rumors are true, that's what's leaving us feeling a bit empty-handed after this one. And we'll talk all about it, I'm sure. Okay, okay. I'm actually going to give it a six. Six uh, yummy edible eggs. <laughs> well, I don't know if they're yummy, but all well, right. Well, to baby Yoda, they're yummy. <laughs> Definitely. Six. Wow, that is your lowest rating ever. I think it is. I can't, you know, I think I wrote down somewhere my ratings for the last year, but I, I don't think I gave anything a six. Um, So what I think you're feeling after, you know, a couple of viewings, I actually felt the first time I watched it. Hmm. I'm, I'll just come out and say it. This is my least favorite chapter of the entire show. Oh, boy. So it's not that it's entirely bad. It's just a little confusing to me. Okay. Uh, what it is and where they placed it in this storyline. I'm pretty sure I know what we're supposed to get out of this episode, which we'll talk about. But I think, I, I think it could be done differently. I think it could have been done more effectively and really fit into the overall plot still. The season's too short, very similar to what we talked about already, but like you said, after that premiere episode, it just seems odd that this episode happened at this point. So um, so based on what we just talked about, it, it just, it may make sense in the end, 
Um, but right now I'm just a little confused by it. Yeah. And it's your last couple of points that I, I can key on uh, that. I agree with that. It seems like an odd place to play, put an episode like this right after such a wham bam opener. Cause people could describe this as a filler episode. They could describe it as a one-off episode. One, one of those ones that they just throw in to, to fill the gap of a long season and it doesn't mean anything to the rest of the season. And what, when you only have eight episodes, every one means something and every one is important. So to even do this is is strange. But I have a feeling we're, we'll are we try to come in the middle here. I think maybe some of the points that I still enjoyed might help uplift you up a little bit. And I think talking about things will help you get the point across that, yeah, they, they may have had a bit of a misstep here. Yeah. <laughs> We'll see. We'll get into it. Let's, let, let, let's get into it. We'll, we'll talk. And I found with this one, I've got a lot of cantina chatter, a lot of fun stuff to talk about, and not so much depth points for yes. our bounty section. I tried hard to find some things, so we'll get into it. But right now, let's get to our cantina chatter. May the force be with you. Yeah, we need the force right now. Okay, let's, let's just kick it off from the very beginning of the episode, the opening shot. Man, Mando is moving. He's flying along in that speeder bike. And I just laughed. They showed a quick little clip of Baby Yoda and he's got no goggles on and he's blinking and his ears are flapping. I'm like, poor little guy. Like he probably can't see anything with all the wind in his face. Like get the kid some goggles. How funny would that look? <laughs> yeah, yeah, very good. <laughs> but I wanted to ask you, but just based on that scene, like he was he was moving and then you see him accelerate even more and go even faster. How, how fast can a speeder bike travel? Do we know? Is there is there a in some type of encyclopedia out there that tells us their speed? Yeah, I actually looked them up in my encyclopedias I got. And uh what what they're known to what they're known to be as fast as is roughly comparable to pod racing. Um Okay. And and if you look at pod racing, um they're they're flying anywhere between two fifty, three hundred miles an hour, which I think to you Wow. Do you do kilometers up there? I think it's yes, like five hundred. I think it's like five hundred kilometers. I'm gonna convert it right now. Three hundred miles per hour is four hundred and eighty-two kilometers per hour. Yeah. Wow. So it's pretty fast. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Three hundred. <laughs> I think. I think our NASCAR cars go upwards around two hundred. You know, one eighty to two hundred miles an hour when they're going around the tracks. Mm -hmm. So this is even faster than that. Yeah. Pod racing is up to, uh, upwards to about three hundred miles an hour. So. Okay, so if you want to get real nitpicky, there's no way Yoda could handle that open air 300 miles per hour without protection for his no, face. And, and when that <laughs> rope came up and the stop, I mean, they probably would have died. <laughs> I mean, he, yeah, because he accelerated right before the rope came up. He actually accelerated. Yeah. And you would have been flown off for, hundred. I mean, tens of feet and... I mean, you were face planted. I mean, 300 miles an hour and all of a sudden stop like that. Yeah, it's, but it's Star Wars. It, it breaks physics. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that ship would have been, that rope would have been like a laser beam. It would have cut that thing in half. Yes. Good thing it didn't. I mean, can you imagine if the rope was just a little higher and hit him in the chest or something? He'd be severed in two pieces. Probably. Yep. But yeah, I mean, they, I mean, they did kind of try to show it. You did see Yoda go flying and he tumbled and was rolling for quite a bit. And, We'll talk about that in just a second. And we saw Mando, which will lead right into my new point here. We saw as he's tumbling from the crash, he ignites the jetpack. But he act as he's tumbling through the air, you see him reach for his arm and punch a few things to ignite the jetpack. Which is like, wait, wait yeah. a second. I thought he got learning the thing. Why, why wouldn't he just react out of instinct and say, you know, whatever it is they do with their mental connection, tell the thing to fly. I, that, that to me was kind of a weird a little step backwards. Yeah, agreed. So I, apparently there is, maybe there isn't a mental thing. It's just, it is all, maybe he's got some connection in, in his gloves that make him not have to think. Hmm. I don't know. It's, uh, <laughs> again, it it's keeps coming up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I thought I'd point that out. But then along with the, with the jetpack, when he tricks the guy to trade for the jetpack and he allows him to fly it off, he actually, it, it he can remote control it like a yes. drone, which was kind of cool. He sends the thing up in the air, shakes the guy a little bit, drops him off, and and brings the jetpack in for a nice smooth landing. So apparently you can control it like a drone. <laughs> you can, apparently, yes. Uh, 
And he totally, I totally saw that coming, which I thought was, I thought that was one of the funner parts of the episode for sure. Yeah. When yeah, he's running away, funny. I'm like, oh man, that guy's dead. He's going to die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's got something set up exactly. <laughs> that was good. That was a good fun moment. Yeah, it was a good opening scene. I mean, it was, mm-hmm. it was, it was great. great. And, and the, yeah. you know, the fighting and stuff too. We'll, we'll talk about that. Now, going back to Baby Or tumbling off of, at, at that speed, he had to, he should have rolled pretty far. I mean, we should have saw him turn into a tumbleweed, you know, like yes. just continually rolling through the desert. But it shook him up though. Like you could see what he was really slow to get up. He was kind of shaking himself off like, whoa, what the heck? It, it did shake him up. So we did take at least somewhat of a tumble. But I, like you said, I think for a baby of that size, that he should have been probably pretty physically hurt. Yes. Yeah. And something that light, again, he would have went flying really, really far. He probably would have still been flying. Like a football. Uh, <laughs> like a football. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Good 50, 60 yards, landed, rolled. Yeah. At that speed. Yeah. It's because you're going that fast too, right? So. Yeah. To all yeah. of a sudden stop. Yeah. You would have. Well, it's that whole scientific theory. If if a fly is in an automobile traveling down the highway at 100 miles an hour, the fly is also going at 100 miles an hour. So if the car instantly stops, the fly will go right through the windshield, which is what happens to us as passengers. You you don't stop because the That's car right. stops. So. That's right. Yeah. So yeah, he's yeah. Yeah, he would have went. He would have went flying. So yeah. <laughs> he would. <laughs> they'd be looking for him with the, you know, with those. Uh, Binoculars, binoculars, Star Wars binoculars. Yep. Where is yep. he? <laughs> now, this scene, though, a couple of Baby Yoda points here because they're, they're just fun. I, I had to just go, aw, because after the crash and after they got rid of the guy that tried to, that had the knife to his throat and they did the little jetpack trick, the way little Baby Yoda runs to Mando with his arms outstretched was irresistible. I, we hadn't seen that connection yet. And the, to me, that was just a little hint at the development of their relationship. Mm-hmm. He looks to him for protection. And it just, it was like a kid running to his dad. Yeah, it was very cool to see. Again, I think that this opening scene was probably the, one of the best in, in the series, I think. Um, and it does, it does show that. It did show a lot of their relationship, a lot of what Baby Yoda considers him. Uh, yeah. which is a guardian, a protector, maybe a father figure. Um, yeah, really cool. And we saw a couple of those moments throughout this episode. Yeah, and I, I've actually got them listed here. So there's the the way he runs up to him, and then later on when they've crashed on the planet, which we'll get to that scene, but when once they've crashed and they're having, Mando says we need to just get some sleep for the night, we see Baby Yoda walk over and, and snuggle up to him on, mm-hmm. on his nice hard metal <laughs> hip but he, he snuggles into him which was kind of cute it's like okay they're they're getting pretty close these two yes yeah you know they've, they've bonded pretty strongly it, it really much is a child and parent or like you said guardian relationship right now but on, a, on another note the funny one that I, I have here is after they dropped the thief from the sky with the jet pack and he runs over and mando picks him up and he's hanging on to him. Did you notice the way he looks? He turns his head and looks up at Mando. He's got that bit of a growl. And he's kind of scowling like, Haha, he deserved that. Is that the kind of feeling you got from that one? I, did, I, didn't get, I didn't get the he deserved it feeling. I got kind of that look where, <laughs> I don't know, like, did you really just do that? That's kind of the look I oh, thought okay. I got. Like, because, you know, he bargained with him. Like, let him go, and I'll give you my pack. And it's almost like, it's like oh, did you just really con this guy? You know, that's, oh. that's, that's what I felt like when, I, when okay. I saw the look. So then the little growl, he could be scowling at Mando. I, that's what I, that's how okay. I interpreted it, but it could, it, it could be that. It could be that, too. <laughs> Even still, it's still a look at his face, though. The way he looks over yes. his shoulder at him, just like, <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty, pretty funny. So, yeah, we'll have to... I don't think there'll ever be clarification as to what he was directing that, but, yeah, you, you could be right there. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty funny. It's, we heard him scowl. It was that's funny. <laughs> now, another funny point here. I, I think we both have a funny reaction to this. When he's walking through the desert carrying all of that stuff 
that's got to be pretty damn hot crossing a desert wearing all that armor and carrying all that gear. I can't imagine how he survives that. And I'm thinking, well, maybe Tatooine isn't a hot desert planet. Is it? like Because we usually think of deserts as being hot and dry oh, yeah. and arid, but oh, yeah. maybe it's just a planet that lacks water and it's relative temperature still. No, it, the, the Twin Suns is, is very hot uh the whole planet is a desert so okay it makes that makes most sense to me i just thought i'd bring it up as a as a question i think it's um i think if you do some research uh if i remember correctly it's again it's 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 reminiscent of our deserts you know out, out like outside um, right california where you know where most of it was shot um and then of course tunisia yeah so yeah, I think it's it's constantly like that. And that's why, but see, that's what, the thing about to think about Tatooine and to think about Jakku, right? Which is the other desert planet that we're experiencing. The reason why people wear all those clothes is not to, again, not to stay warm. It's to protect themselves from the sun, getting sunburnt and right. So, it, it, but also it does get, when the suns go down, it actually gets very cool um, in, in, on, on those planets. So, Okay, so very much like the Grand Canyon. I, I did go hiking in the Grand Canyon. It was super hot during the day. And when the sun went down, it actually was freezing down there. Freezing, yeah. Yeah. So. Crazy. Very similar to Tatooine in that aspect. So, okay. but him walking, you know, yeah, <laughs> that can't be fun at all. And a long way. I mean, what, what were you thinking? Like, what? Why are they walking through the desert with all that stuff? Why is he bringing all that stuff back? Yeah, I mean, for some reason he had to keep carrying that meat and, <laughs> and the armor. <laughs> but my thought was, my first thought when he started walking was, doesn't he have a jetpack? Like, why doesn't he fly? <laughs> yeah, I see. Why? I mean, I Unless it's too great a distance, maybe the jetpack has a limit. It's got fuel. I don't. I don't know how they operate. So maybe. But I mean, he could have gotten at least halfway there, right? Yeah, help yourself out a little bit. <laughs> but I don't know. Or he can't balance it carrying all that stuff. Maybe he can't fly properly. He can't balance it yet. Maybe. I don't know. Well, fly. Leave it somewhere. Fly in. Get something. To, get another speeder and go pick that stuff up. Yeah. Yeah, I taught the answers. I'm with you. <laughs> it's just, uh, and it wasn't a comfortable ride for poor baby Yoda, too. He was bouncing and shaking all around on his hip there. So. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, he gets into Tatooine and Mos Eisley again, and here comes a recurring character. Apparently, Peli is back. She seems to be showing up a little bit more than others, which is telling me from what we saw this episode and the way she was behaving and, and trying to scam and whatever, she's becoming a bit of a scammer. They're developing her character a little bit every time we see her. Yeah. Um, she's already a very much a reoccurring character, very similar to, to Quill last season. Um, we saw him in the first couple episodes and then we saw him at the end, you know, I think chapter seven. Um, so I, yeah. I think she's kind of replaced that character, you know, um, I think so. Even though we got Pelly in, in season one as well. But um, yeah, already in two episodes, I think I, it, do, it does seem like we're going to be coming to Tatooine almost maybe maybe often, you know? Yeah. Um, it, it's like it's going to be his base of operations or something. Is, is his repair shop, you know, come and re get his ship repaired and back up to speed and... Yeah. Um, because Quill, Quill, you thought you 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 felt like Quill was going to be that that crew member that was actually on the ship, not that he would go visit him, but that that see that episode where he asks him to basically, "I'll pay you to come with me." I actually thought he was going to, and that's where that's so how he was going to be part of that. Yeah, me too. Yeah, but it seems like she's going to be that uh, me mechanic for him. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't see her ever leaving to go with him either. She's just there for him to come visit every once in a while. But she's, like I said, becoming a bit of a scammer. She's, I mean, she scanned him out of that, those 500 credits in the yeah. card game, which yeah. obviously the bet wasn't for, but uh, it, she's, yeah. So we'll, we'll see what they do more with her. I don't, uh, I don't foresee them killing her off as well. She seems to have found her, her spot that he needs. So she'll probably come around. Now, 
that ant character, you've got him here in the notes, whoever that ant was that she's playing cards with. Yes. So the ant, uh, she calls him Dr. Mandible. Um, <laughs> that was just slang, a joke, right? Like she wasn't actually revealing his name. I, I mean, that's the name he's now given, I guess. Um, I think <laughs> okay. it's Dr. Mandible. Um, but, you know, thing to point out too, um, which I forgot to add in here because I don't think we have it in here, but this, the episode was directed by Peyton Reed, which was the director of the Ant-Man movie for Marvel. Right. So this was, this has been written as his, you know, homage to directing Ant-Man. You see a big giant ant sitting there. Oh, I get it. Okay. Playing, uh, <laughs> playing uh, Sabak with uh, Pelly. But I went back and watched really briefly him entering the Tatooine, the cantina in chapter five of last season. And sure enough, Dr. Manable is actually sitting there also at the bar. Oh, so it's the same character. I don't remember. Yeah, yeah. In fact, well, I was going to talk about this later too, but um, the frog, the frog lady, they they haven't given her a name necessarily yet, but frog lady was actually in the cantina also. Really, you noticed Chapter her five. there? Yes. Oh. There's actually a close up shot of her when Mando Jeez. first walks in. Uh, I never noticed it until I rewatched it earlier, but. But it's funny because, again, and then, of course, R5 is, you know, in that shot also. So there's three characters already in that cantina shot in Chapter 5 that were, again, seen in uh, this season. <laughs> cool. Well, it's the, I mean, it's the denizens of the cantina. They, they like hanging out. So Yes. Doctor, apparently, Dr. Manable is a regular at the cantina. So, yes. <laughs> cool. Cool. Well, that's neat. I mean, it, it gives us a chance to get to know these guys and see them pop up from... You know, time to time, that's good. Yes. Good, good, good. Now, he finds out some information here about where where he's got to go to f to locate some other Mandalorians. And apparently they're on the moon of Trask, which is part of a gas giant system called the Coliban system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's new to me. Do we know the system? Do you know that system, Mr. Encyclopedia? I have not. Uh, I had to look it up, but because uh, I had not remembered ever hearing about those names um and as far as i could tell they are completely new systems introduced in the mandalorian so uh -huh. we have not been there now the rumor is what i've been reading in in some of the uh, some of the stuff online is that the water planet that we see in the trailers that's where that is apparently going to be trask oh well it makes sense not Mon not Moncala, which is what we thought of. Possibly. What we thought, okay. Well, that I mean that makes sense because if you go back to, I mean, this is going all the way to the end of the episode. But if you go back to the trailer for the season, the trailer opens up with a limping ship, all banged up. Well, we now see where that comes from. Correct. It, come, it came from this episode. I think it's going to be the very first shot of this next episode. The next, the next episode is him limping to Trask. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if, if that that would make sense because that's where they're going. If it's a suitable planet for these frog people, well, it's an all water planet. Makes sense. Yep. And maybe there's just the Mon Moncali, you know, people there because they they'll go from water planet to water planet Correct. to make a living. So it, yeah. it makes sense, right? So and they're all in the same vicinity. They're all you know they're very close to each other because Moncali oh, okay. is very close to Tatooine, and apparently this is too. So it's this new system that we're introduced to. So it again, it makes sense that you know Favreau and Filoni, they do they, even though they do like introducing uh, you know us to to similar characters, you know our five characters that we've known for years. Uh, but it, and of course, going back to Tatooine is a familiar location. But it feels like they are still trying to introduce new planets and new systems and add it to the encyclopedia. So. Yeah, they're well. Uh, I mean, they're expanding the universe. They're growing the universe, absolutely. Which, yep. which is cool because you don't you don't want to just see the same old same old all the time. It's it, it's a gigantic galaxy. There's tons out there, so it's really neat to just continue seeing more. That's one of the fun things always about Star Wars is all the different planets we get to visit. So if they want to keep adding more, hey, I'm all for it. That's cool. Yeah, absolutely. Now 
they crashed in this episode when the, when the X wings are chasing them. They crash through a very clouded planet, which then ends up being frozen with tons of snow and ice. And we will talk about that a little more in depth. But I, I wanted to ask, is this the Kaliban system that they crash in? Did they make it there when the X-Wings, you know, came up to them? Is Were they just about, because he's traveling sublight, he's not traveling hyperspace. So right. they finally get there and that's when they get chased to, because he's just flying through space. We had no idea they were near any planet. They're just flying through space and the X-Wings show up beside them. And he's just like, ah, nope. And that's what you see him push forward on the controls and that the ship, the Razor Crest goes into a dive. Boom, they're in the atmosphere. Oh, they must be there. But you're telling me here in our notes that that's not Trask or the or the Kaliban system, the, the gas giant. It's not. And I'm not sure how this was confirmed, but doing the research online, um, it is actually somehow known that this is actually Malbo Crease. From season one. The same planet from season one. Yeah. From the first episode. From the first episode where he where he captured Mithril. Right. Wow. So it's the same planet. So he just happens to be going by there on his way to Trask. Yeah, I guess kind of makes sense because again, all of these planets are relatively in the same uh you know, relatively close to each other in the same sectors over right. next to each okay. other. Okay. So Tatooine, Navarro, Maldo Crease, Trask, I guess, Moncala, you know, all these are kind of relatively, even Mandalore is even somewhere close to this uh, also. So uh, they're all, they're all there, collected in the outer rim here. Is there a, a map of the Star Wars galaxy? Is, is there a complete map showing all the planets and all the systems? The uh, Yeah, the most up-to-date one, um, you know, was uh, I actually have it in a book here. Um, it came out maybe a few months ago. Um, so it obviously keeps getting updated when new systems are introduced, like Trask and the Cole Eben system. They'll add it to it. Right. So whenever it gets whenever it gets re released, it's always updated with new new planets. But yeah, they constantly update it, and there is a there is a map out there where you can look at and see where these systems are. Yeah, I'd, I'd love a visual reference. I'm gonna we'll find a picture and post it on the Facebook page because right? I'd love mm -hmm. to see a visual reference that just helps me place where everything is and how they can travel from one to the other. That's I think a visual reference will really really help uh, show that to us. So, which is funny because again, one it's one of the things where even traveling sublight. I mean, I, I'd be interesting to know how fast that is too because. These systems still are light years away from each other. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So how much time is passing when they're flying? Yeah, it would take him years <laughs> to get from one system to the. I would think, but you know, I, <laughs> you would think so. Yeah, yeah. Sublight. Maybe that means you're. Maybe that's not. Maybe it's light speed. It's not. But it can't. He's not going light speed though. He's just like flying. It seems like. Yeah, well, if if lights, what, what's light speed? Uh, sorry, it's I think it's it's three hundred and thirty thousand miles per hour, or miles per second. Sorry, Mile, miles, yeah, per, miles second. per second. Okay, and yes. six hundred sixty thousand kilometers per second. Because yeah, I remember, but that's but that's light speed. I don't even that's I light think, speed. So maybe sublight is a hundred thousand miles per second. Maybe because sublight, maybe it's just below the threshold of having to break that that energy barrier they need to to travel at the speed of light. Maybe but it's just below that. That's what I'm saying. I don't think I even and. Someone out there, please correct me if I'm wrong, but even in Star Wars, hyperspace is actually faster than light speed. Like hyperspace uh, is even faster. So they don't right. travel light speed. They travel hyperspace. So um, okay. it's even faster. So that's it's why I think faster. sublight, maybe it's sublight is like light speed, but let me not as fast as light speed. But <laughs> because you, I think she even says it, like you can't travel, you can't travel hyperspace, not light speed. Yeah, she said hyperspace. You can't yeah, travel hyperspace. Hyperspace is, is, is their type of travel. It's Star Wars' type of travel, which is even faster than light speed. I, actually, that's something I didn't know. Science, Star Wars science-wise, I did not know hyperspace was faster than light speed. That's fantastic. If you think about it, even the speed of light. So if hyperspace is faster, the speed of light is, like I said, it's roughly uh, 
330,000 miles per second. I just did the math on that. The Earth is something like 24,000 miles around in circumference or something like that. Mm -hmm. So imagine, I did the math here, traveling at light speed means you, in one second, you would go around the Earth 28 times. In wow. one second. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing about it is, is like the, what's crazy about light speed, right? If I'm if I'm correct in this, if there is a system or a planet that's ten thousand light years away, you would have to be traveling at the speed of light, and it would still take you ten thousand years to get there. Right. That's what that means. If it's ten thousand light, light years, years away. away Meaning you have if you're traveling at the speed of light, you would take you ten thousand years. Ten thousand years, yeah, yeah. It's that's it's. I forget. So you have to travel faster than the speed of light. To faster than the speed any, of light to make yeah. up any speed in space. Yeah, which is hyperspace. Yeah, which is but why, you, like, yeah, I think you're right with the math there because I remember figuring all this out. I'm fascinated by the space science, but me too. I, I think something like the the closest star to us is 75 light years away or something. That's the closest one to us, so it would take 75 years to get there if we could travel the speed of light. If we could travel the speed of light, yes. So think of that, like that. That's why we're never going to visit any other planets. Why in our lifetimes, anyway, we're not going to see another planet because we won't be able to get there. That's why we have to send out a shuttle or a completely uh, autonomous robotic shuttle. And three generations from now, we'll be able to say, hey, we landed on a new planet finally. Like, you know, or or they develop yeah. cryogenic sleep or whatever. But well, or somehow we figured out how to, yeah, I mean, I mean, Hyperspace feels like it's it's almost like bending space and time and bending yeah. wormhole, creating wormholes, and you know even though they're not saying it, that's the way to do it. You know that's the way that if you can somehow cre bend space in order to get to one point to the other, we're totally getting off subject here. But that's I'm fascinated by. It. I I love <laughs> space. That's why I love Star Wars. I love the whole sci-fi yeah. aspect of it. Yeah, and, and traveling in hyperspace has always been intriguing to me. Well, and it's, we, yeah, we may be on a little bit of a fun Star Wars science tangent here, but we're just trying to relate it to real science that we know so far. I mean, there's so much stuff in the galaxy that we don't know of, and I'm not talking Star Wars galaxy, real life galaxy. There's stuff we, there's physics out there that we've never even heard of before, mm -hmm. the way this universe is working, but it, it is fascinating. And Star Wars likes to, and Star Trek and all these other space shows, they like to take some of the realistic science to Tell, use as a basis to tell their stories, but then they like to make stuff up to, because you want to tell a good story. And how can you travel travel from planet to planet and call a thing Star Wars if you can't somehow go faster than the speed of light? It just all full circle comes together and makes sense. And a lot of it you have to don't don't be one of the person that just, well, what that's not real. What yeah. if no just just enjoy it. Totally. Who cares that it's not fully realistic because we don't actually know. It's a galaxy far, far away, remember. They've got different science over there. How do we know? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right? Yeah. So Yeah, just the physics side of it, you just got to let it go. Exactly. Just let but, it go and have fun. In our world, we have to figure out a lot of things in order to be able to travel through space. <laughs> it's, yeah, exactly. And it's the same thing if you want to talk about time travel. It's We don't know. You got to, you know, mm -hmm. we know what we know and it doesn't work for us right now, but who knows? So. Right. Now let's let's bring this full circle now because we were we got off on our tangent talking about the planets. Now let's get back to the snowy planet because if I'm not mistaken, this is the scene we saw in the trailer when we weren't sure if that was the Razor Crest crashed in the snow. I thought that looks like a different shape. It's not the same ship. Well, it's because it was half buried in the ice. That's why it looked different. That's right. Now we saw that and we got that shot with Baby Yoda sitting in the snow and Mando kneels down beside him and you're like, ooh, what are they looking at? And then in the trailer, we see him carrying him through some ice caves. Now, we all thought, and we're thinking, that's got to be Elam. It has to be Elam. What? Oh, why wouldn't it be? And I'm pretty sure this planet in this episode was all of those shots we got from the trailer. It is not Elam. You just verified that it's probably the same planet we got in season one, episode one. It, it's not Elam, if that's what this is not. That's our first big disappointment. That's our first big letdown because it makes this, this planet basically was not irrelevant, really, because who cares? And the second point I wanted to make, and you can add whatever thoughts you want to Avisla, 
we never got the actual cave shot that was in the trailer. The one of the, the big entrance to the cave and the, the big ice shot when he's carrying baby Yoda and where, and you saw him going into the, and you're like, Oh, that's Elam. He's going into the, the Kyber crystal cave. Yeah. We didn't even get that shot here. Yeah. It's not Elam and probably means that we're not going to see Elam. Um, so the theory of finding something to do with the crystals and, Kyber crystals and going to that planet, uh, probably not going to be. So yeah, that's, that's a little bit of a disappointment, but, um, but you know, it doesn't mean we're not obviously going to get still Ahsoka and, and stuff like that. So, um, it, it was just, it, it was just weird that you heard, you heard. So not all the rumors that we're hearing are true. Let's just go there because that's, that's one of the rumors that was out there was that it, we were going to see a visit to Elam. Yeah. Well, and that's, I mean, you, you get all, all of the fans like that, like us that are so passionate about this, we start getting all these hopes and these, and that's what, you know, you guys were talking about inside the force is we got to keep a lid on that stuff. Don't get so high in your expectations. Don't get your hopes up so high because episodes like this are going to come along and let us down because you're, I think we're, we're planning ahead. We're thinking too far too fast of what Mandalorian can do. And they might have plans like that, but maybe five seasons from now, they're, they're just going very slowly and taking their time with things. Judging by, you know, baby Yoda's behavior, this episode as, as one marker to look at, it's, they're not rushing anything at all. So we're not going to get these great big, I, th I think, I think they're going to keep the, the lid on the pot for reveals and just keep one or two big reveals per season kind of thing. You know, like last season was baby Yoda and this season, it's Boba Fett. That might be our biggest reveal we get. I don't know. I'm just saying, it, I understand the disappointment. And now that I'm looking, I'm like, ah, yeah, we had so many hopes for this sequence of events, the ice planet. And it came to fruition to be nothing but a cave full of spiders on the same, on the same planet we've already seen. Ah, you know, like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, again, it's. It, they just made it seem so much like it. And again, it, when you're seeing it in the trailer also, you have no, I, I had no thoughts that it was the same planet we've already seen, which is what no. they're telling us, right? It, does, it doesn't look like it at all. No. There was no visual, right? Because what we saw in season one was like almost like an entire lake of ice that he's walking across and the, you know, the, the taxi speeders and all the, and the little, the little town that was built on the ice, like it, didn't look like that at all. Yeah, uh, which means he probably landed on the other side of the planet, which you know seemed a lot more calmer because it seemed like there was a you know more of a windstorm and icy and frost you know in the in the first season where this one's a little sunnier and calmer, just a bunch of snow and ice. So and mountains and, and stuff. Mountains, yeah. yeah, yeah. It doesn't yeah. seem like the same, but it ends up being the same. Ah, <sighs> all right. Well. Disappointment one out of the way. <laughs> yeah. I, I do want to hit off real fast because um, I actually did find, I think, which is the latest map of the galaxy. And I actually want to, I might want to need to correct myself that I think that, because uh, I've been saying Mon Calamari is, is close to Tatooine and it is not. It's close know. to, uh, well, if you remember in our discussions back uh, prior to the season, we talked about Mon Calamari being the reason why we thought it was Mon Calamari in the trailer was because his his path would possibly lead him to Lothal, which was the planet of the rebels, right? Because that's where Ahsoka and Sabine, you know, knew each other and whatnot. Uh, Mon Calamari is close to Lothal, but uh, Tatooine is 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 in the outer rim, but further away and. And it's Tatooine that's actually closer to, uh, no, I'm sorry. It is Mandalore closer to the fall and all that stuff. So he could make his way up there, but right now he's down here in Tatooine hmm. and the surrounding okay. areas there. Well, well, we'll post a link on the Facebook page and everyone can kind of get that visual reference, like you said, and it'll, it'll help think, us. Yeah. And the most recent map is, was released in the, uh, the rise of the rise of Skywalker's encyclopedia uh visual dictionary okay that's the most recent map so it doesn't include a lot of the planets you would think of because there are if you google if you google star wars galaxies galaxy um 
you'll find a map that has a ton of worlds on it. Like, I mean, so thou probably a thousand. But again, that was made probably in as as um over the years and years and years of all the legends and all the planets and everything that was mentioned throughout everything. But again, a lot of that stuff's not canon anymore. So hmm. so what you get into the visual dictionaries of the movies, they usually release a map in those. That's what's canon these days. Okay. Cool. So it's, so it's only every anything you've heard or mentioned in again the TV series or the movies right now. Yep. That's yeah. it. Or in the books, technically. Right. No, it makes sense though. The cool I, I still want to see it. I still want to see an updated map. It just gives me that you know, yeah. my bearings, I guess you could say. Totally. <laughs> in, totally. in the space stuff. All right. Now the frog lady. We brought her up. Let's talk about her a little bit. I didn't hear a name of the species. I didn't even hear a name for this character. So I want to ask you, do we know who she is? Do we know this species? Or is this something also new for the show? She is new. Um, hmm. And interesting, we never even got a name of her. Yeah. She's been categorized online as frog lady. Yeah, that's it. It's a, it is type of frogish, frog-like species. Haven't seen it before. Again, she was in season one, chapter five, in the cantina. Mm-hmm. If you rewatch that, there's a shot of her sitting there. Um, I mean, it, it, and it's blatant. It's not like she's in the background. It is a close-up shot of her sitting there talking really briefly as Manda's walking into the cantina. Oh, and so she's looking for travel back then already. I guess, or or she wasn't, you know, she didn't have eggs yet at that point, and she was just hanging out. Uh, <laughs> but she, yeah, that was her first appearance, and then, of course, this is the second appearance of that species. So I don't even know what, I've never heard that language either, obviously. So, yeah. and somehow Pelly was able to say speak it. And that that one threw me off. I, I I was watching her. I'm like, is she really making those sounds? That's really strange. Yeah. <laughs> so so because I, I, I think you were you were asking if if she understood basic, which I don't think she can. I don't think she understood basic. I well, I think the frog lady did. I think because people were talking to her in English, she seemed to understand Mando when he spoke to her, but she would only speak her own language back. It, it seemed like she understood. I thought Mando said something like, "Do you understand what do, or to ask her if you understand?" No, I thought no. He he says I don't. He just kept saying I, I don't understand you. Oh, because he he said you know take a nap. We got to stay here. So she went to bed. He yeah. Every everything he ever told her, she seemed to follow his directions. So okay. Well, you know, look at when she was sitting in the pool, and he's like, "I got. I can't protect you." And then why didn't Pelly just speak basic to her? Maybe it's easier for uh, to understand. I don't know. Maybe it's to give <laughs> Pelly a, a comedy scene. I don't know. Yeah, that's like why. That's the only reason I didn't think she spoke spoke basic was because she didn't speak basic to her. Yeah, but it makes me wonder that this frog species. Okay, she's on Tatooine. Her husband is on this. Trask planet, which is the only other planet that's habitable for them, which is obviously a water planet, then why the heck is she on a desert planet? What's she doing there? <laughs> I, I maybe she that's how I was thinking the same thing, but maybe she came and to shop a little bit, you know, buy something. <laughs> yeah. What flippers like, ended up having on. ended up having the eggs and then knew she couldn't travel through hyperspace yeah. now back home. So now she's trying to find a way. That's the only thing I can think of, but unless she, I mean, Moss Eisley is a spaceport, so maybe she got travel part way and and couldn't get all. She wasn't taken all the way. Yeah, so maybe she's stuck maybe. there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Now the fun fact about her, this frog lady, she was played the person in the costume. It was not CGI. It was Misty Rosas, who was also the character actor for Quill. Nice. Which I thought was kind of cool. They're using the same lady to play all the, the short character parts that are in costumes. That's kind of cool. That's fun for her. Um, makes me happy to hear things like that. It is very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Now, it apparently, she's very good with tech. She's smart with tech. She looked over at Zero's body there, the android from the prison episode in season one, which... I found it was kind of funny that Mando kept the droid body sitting there after he blew it apart. We can talk about that if you want, but I, it it was interesting to see that she 
knew what she was doing. She hooked into his quote unquote vocabulator <laughs> to be able to communicate basic with Mando. Yeah, I thought that was weird. You know, when when they showed that scene, you know, at the very front as a recap, you know, I actually forgot about that scene. And I had to remember, like, I had to think for a second, like, where, what episode was that? Oh, yeah, it was the prison episode. Um, <laughs> so I, I completely forgot about him in a sense. Um, so when they, yeah, when she hooked it up and when he started speaking the voice, I, I definitely remembered. But uh, yeah, very clever to be able to do that. And in fact, that's, uh, if, if there was one scene that really drew me in, I actually felt like that was a good scene. Yeah. Well, it, it she was able to tell her story a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and well, and, you know, become a great motivator for him because mm -hmm. at that point he was pretty much just kind of packing it up. Like, I'm going to just lay here until something happens and not really do anything. Yeah. Yeah. She uh, had to basically kick him in the butt. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I did laugh when he called it, she, when she called it the vocabulator, I'm like, boy, that's like, uh, like, um, avatars unobtainium, <laughs> like just the oh, vocabulators. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah pretty yeah. funny. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, and why do you, why do you think Mando kept Zero's body when he hates droids as much as he did? Why would he still have it and not just toss it out in the trash? I, I didn't get that well, either. Well, I mean, well, maybe he forgot about it and you know, just threw it on the shelf. I mean, or maybe one day knew he was going to use it for parts. You know, I mean, uh, you could, there's no telling. But uh, yeah, again, it, goes, it actually goes back to it does, it's, it does bring up the whole time factor again. Like, how long has it actually been? Yeah. Because maybe it hasn't actually been as long as we think it has. You know, maybe, especially again, with Frog Lady being in Chapter 5 of last season and still there, you know, maybe it's only been a month. That's true. Uh, you know? And yeah. Maybe he's got Zero packed up in there and just didn't remember after everything that's been happening that he was even there. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, true. I don't know. I don't know. Doesn't seem like uh, as much time has passed as maybe we thought. Could be less. Yeah, you're right. Well, let's talk about those X-Wing pilots. They came up already. We noticed that one of them is Dave Filoni again as Trapper Wolf. And this time we had a new one. It was Captain Carson Teva, who was played by Paul Sun Hyung Lee. I don't know if I pronounced it right. Did that I say looks that right? right. That looks right. Okay. Now, I don't know if you know who he is, but he is from a Toronto-based Canadian TV show called Kim's Convenience. Do you know that show? No. <laughs> okay, well, it's, it's about a Korean family owning a variety store in the streets of Toronto. And it's it's a half-hour comedy show. It's like uh, like your Corner Gas or what, you yeah. know, those kind of shows. I don't know if you know those ones, all these little Canadian shows that are popping up up here that are pretty popular. It's, it's done really well. It's it's really well received and pe fans love him. And apparently when they saw him, Mandalorian fans saw him and they're also fans of that show. They freaked out and are going a little bit crazy right now that he got to be an X-Wing captain, not just a pilot. He was a captain. Yes. Yeah. No, I, I, I'd, ne I'd not known who he was, I but that, that's, that show sounds pretty funny actually. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, like you said, a Canadian Canadian Korean family that just running of a convenience store on the corner of some street. Yeah. <laughs> who, so who does he play in that? He's the dad who owns He's the, the store. I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, nice. Pretty funny stuff. Now, I want to talk about this scene because we speculated about those X wings and what's going on. You and me had a, you know, we we were countering each other. You you thought that they're attacking him and it, they're the ones causing the damage, and I said no, they're just escorting him. They're there to help him. And really, our, both our theories are kind of wrong if you if you really look at it. Neither of them were, they weren't escorting him, nor were they attacking him. Although they did chase him once Mando fled to try to get away from them. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but I, I mean, I, I we were kind of partially right, right? I mean, they <laughs> yeah, I guess we both kind are kind of bit. caused the damage, maybe not by shooting him, but. You know, the chase caused the damage. True. True. I'll give you that much. Yeah. I mean, they, they just didn't fire on him. 
you know? No. Which No. And they were actually good. friendly at first. They're just like, hey, oh, yeah. Yeah. you know, you just you just need to have a transponder turned on and you need some some information for us. And they didn't have it, so he fled. Like they were friendly at first. Mm-hmm. And they ended up being friendly in the end because they came back to help him up. And uh, you know, help him out and come to his rescue, which That's right. I thought was kind of cool. I didn't expect that. I'll, I got that question for you a little bit later on, but I was really impressed with how good a shot they were. They're definitely not like stormtroopers. No, no, yeah. <laughs> if they were, if stormtroopers shot that good, we the rebellion would have lost a long time ago. I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> so truer words were never spoken yeah 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 i mean they're just firing away and I'm, I'm wondering when they shot that big papa spider did did they use the x-wing cannons for that do you think i don't think so i think they used the blasters just, they just the blasters because the blasters. that took a couple of good shots it they did. looked a lot it looked a lot bigger to me that's why i thought maybe the x-wing blasters because that the first two shots that took them off off of the the razor crest it, it didn't sound like it though that's the thing because like yeah I, the true. x-wing blasters have a pretty distinct sound i think it was just the blasters yeah from the guns true. yeah anyway cool stuff cool stuff, cool stuff. pilots and fun for dave flown to get to play that part again uh-huh, <laughs> uh-huh. now this is the stuff that i was joking about in my opening statement there the scary stuff i there, there's no way tell me if you got this vibe too Vizla. I'm not the only one that was cowering from the scene, totally feeling the aliens vibes. You know, Sigourney Weaver, Rip, um, Ripley, I mean, when Baby Yoda goes walking through the snow into that field of pods all over the ground. Did that not ring aliens to you? A hundred percent. Even even the way the egg opened. The way the egg, the way he he dug into one, and there's a baby something in there, and yes. he eats it, and and it's all gooey, and then all the other eggs start opening. The entire thing, and they must have been paying homage to aliens. I don't know why, but they were. Yeah, I totally agree. No, I got the, I got the whole alien vibe, and you knew it was going to be something with with a bunch of legs that came out of it. Um, mm-hmm. End up being more like spiders, but yeah, when he grabbed that thing out of there, it very much looked like. You know, one of those, what is face huggers, you know? Yes, face huggers. Ugh. And it just, I mean, this sequence went, went from that moment, the music that kicked in, it all through the entire sequence until, until the X Wing pilots save him, that entire sequence, the music was just pulse pounding and tense and kept me on the edge of my seat, panicking. And that it just had such a sci-fi horror vibe, very much like Aliens, just this horror vibe as they're chasing him and there's all different sizes of spiders and he's not going to make it. And, you know, he shoots them. You think he, you think he's getting back to the Razor Crest. He's safe. No, they, there are hundreds of them get in the ship and he's trying to crawl up the ladder and they're surrounding him. It's just, it's, it's freaky moments, very horror movie vibe. And, you don't for a second there. You're thinking these guys aren't going to get out of here. Like they, they almost got them. And the, there's that one that crawls down on top of Baby Yoda's head, and it's trying to peck at him. And Baby Yoda's like, ah, help, help! And Frog Lady ends up shooting it. But it's just that it was such a phenomenal scene. I, I, I'm probably going to change that to my favorite scene of the whole episode. It just, huh. it was so well done. I thought they got the horror vibe. They got the sci-fi thriller. It, it, it just the, the tensity of it was so well done. I was really, really happy with that. And that's probably what's riding mostly for me on on making this episode fun, like giving all its high marks, is how well they did that sequence because it was genuinely scary. I mean, I watched it on my little five-inch phone at work and I was sweating. You're like, oh my God, this is freaky. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I did the same. I, I watched it first on my phone. Uh, I woke up actually at three in the morning, East Coast time, and watched it <laughs> oh, again. Oh, jeez. <laughs> um, Again, a little disappointed that I woke up for that, but uh, either way, this, this point number two. Yep, I watched. Uh, <laughs> but you know, I, I agree with you. I think it was a pretty intense moment. But you know, the thing about it is, is that's kind of my that's kind of why I gave it a little bit of a lower rating because we had just gotten in the premiere a, a kind of intense moment with a creature, right? So, which is you know, crate dragon that we're all very familiar with but so it was kind of again it was almost like a repeat for me like okay so we're running and trying to figure out how to kill another beast creature 
Okay. I see that point. Yeah. So that's where I, that's where I kind of got confused on why we're doing this again, you know. But but you know, to 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 your point with the spiders themselves. Now, this is, this is a funny this is a funny thing because when I first saw it, though, I was actually really excited, Be- and only because now it, that the what I haven't I haven't found exactly what people are calling these precise spiders. What I've read is that people are calling them, people are referring to these spiders as a, the species that we've been introduced to on Star Wars Rebels. There was a species of creature, spider-like creatures called the, Cry, the, the Krikna. Hmm. And there was an episode on there where they established this new base and um, on the planet called uh, Ant- Ant- Antalon. And these spiders came up out of the ground and they basically had to fight them off, right? Okay. Um, now, the, here's the thing, is the difference between those spiders and the reason why I don't think these are the same spiders is because those spiders on Rebels were, you couldn't shoot them. They were, they're, they're, their their shells were so hard the blasters just kind of bounced off of them. Oh, they were armored really well. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Okay. So then it wouldn't be the same ones then. Yeah. Th- yes. That makes sense. And um, so so I don't think they're that species. In fact, I haven't really read. I think people are thinking that's what they were, but I don't think they are. And probably now, new. What's that? They're probably new. They're, yeah. There's they're, a lot of probably new new. Stuff But absorbed, what they yeah. look like. And I think they ultimately will be referenced as these. So, again, what I thought was funny was, um, do you, are you familiar with Fantasy Flight Games? The company? Mm. Okay. No, not really. But So there's a company called Fantasy Flight okay. that creates a bunch of tabletop games. And they have a license with Star Wars, Lucasfilm, and they create a bunch of Star Wars games. So I don't know if you've seen any miniature games like where they have the dice and the yeah oh yeah the, so they so that's what they, they that's fantasy flight they create they create a a miniatures game called called X wing miniatures uh, I've they seen also, that one actually yeah yeah they also create a game called Star Wars Legion which is a bunch of miniatures uh, Rebel Assault and stuff like that they well they used to have a game they stopped making it but they used to have a game called Star Wars the card game and I picked up this game as soon as it came out. Me and some friends and family. Of course, here. you did. <laughs> oh, it, it it is it is such a great game. It is a really really fun game. It you know takes about 30, 40 minutes to play. Really competitive. I actually played in a couple tournaments with it. the The great thing about the game is that you know it has characters and creatures and all this stuff. And um, and this is before the new. It came out right before the new canon was introduced. So. It used a lot of cards and creatures and everything from the from Legends. Well, one of the cards, right. which was one of my favorite cards, I loved playing with the Jedi side of the cards, the affiliation. People that are listening may, may understand what I'm saying. But um, there was a card that came out with Yoda's um, set. Like you, you had a character that had a set of cards that came with it. And Yoda, which was na- native to Dagobah, had a bunch of cards with he had a bunch of creatures with him because they were all Dagobah centric creatures. Well, one of them was the Nobby, it's called the Nobby White Spider. And the card, when you look at it, it it is this creature. It is the creature that you see in this episode. It's got a big white, it's got the snout, everything, it's got the eggs on the ground. Um now the difference though, the Nobby White Spider which was never canonized. You never saw the creature in any book or movie. The only time it was ever referenced, it was in Ralph McQuarrie drawings back when he was doing The Empire Strikes Back because okay. Luke, one of his training, he ended up, one of his training sessions, he ends up coming across a big giant knobby white spider and all these eggs on the ground. And if you and we, we should post this also probably because if you look this up, how do you, you spell see, that? Uh, Nobby is K N O B B Y. Okay. Nobby White Spider. You can see the classic image of Luke standing in oh. front of this thing, and it's laying the <laughs> eggs and everything. 
Yeah. Um, it, it, you know what it is? It look at it. It's oh, it's it. It clearly, I think it is. It yeah. just hasn't been referenced yet that that was that's what it was. Um, yeah. But that's. But I was so excited because I loved that card and I I played that card all the time. So as soon as I saw that in this chapter, I was like, oh my gosh, the Navi White Spider. They finally <laughs> canonized it. But I haven't seen online where they've confirmed that's what it was, but maybe they will. But um, I think that's what it is, and I think they, I think he pulled that from. But again, in 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 Ralph McQuarrie's drawings and what it was, it was a Dagobah uh, creature, not necessarily a creature that was in the sand and the or in the snow and the ice. So, but again, the Navi has never been the Navi spider has never been canonized, so. Well, could there you go. Now. I think it just was now. Could be. <laughs> yeah. But, no, but, the... but but again, what I'm reading is that the Navi white spider was the the legends creature, and then the canonized creature of it was the the Krynka, Krykna, or Krikna, which was in Rebels. But I think they could they could be still both. They could be two different ones, you know. So anyway. But we do know that. Floney and Favreau love to pull deep from totally. all things Star Wars, whether it's, I mean, they've gone as far as making a toy come to life on this show with the Stormtrooper uh, troop, whatever tractor thing, <laughs> the bus yes. that carry the troops on. So they, they've done, they like to pull from all kinds of things to bring them to life. So if they, maybe they enjoyed playing this card game too, and they like the spider just like you did, and they wanted to bring that to life because why not? It's freaky as hell. It's, uh, the most nightmarish thing I've ever seen in Star Wars. And it's, yeah, it's scary. I mean, I, it, it's funny because my partner, Lisa, she was going to send in feedback and just basically be crying over how scary the spiders were, but then she <laughs> changed her mind. <laughs> I said, oh, don't worry, I'll make fun of you on the show anyway, because she was, she was screeching <laughs> like a little girl and hiding behind the blanket. They, she did not like these things at all. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. Very, very anyway, freaky. so big background. That was a long-winded answer, but my, basically, I was excited to see them because I was excited from the card game that I played that these things showed up. Yeah, yeah, I know that's very cool. Well, let's get into our favorite scenes. <laughs> Nobody laughs like Java. <laughs> All right, I mean, I. I am going to change it. My favorite scene originally was the X-Wing chase sequence, which leads to this cave area. I just, I, I love X-Wings. You guys have heard me talk about that before. I just loved watching them rip through the cloud sky, chasing after the Razor Crest. It was a very cool scene, good action scene. And just watching the X-Wings just float beside him nice and slowly. And he's like, uh, switch to channel two. And you know, he, they obviously are talking behind the scenes and then you see that the, the X-Foils just open up and I'm like, oh yeah, it's so cool. It's such a simple thing, but it just, it's just so cool. I love the X-Wings. and But I, I think that this entire horror sequence with the spiders chasing them was just so well done. It was just for sci-fi horror, doesn't have to have anything to do with Star Wars, just sci-fi horror. It was phenomenally put together and really well done. Scary as hell. My my action is definitely the opening scene. Okay. Yeah, he you know him flying on that speeder. We talked about it, getting flown off. But the fight sequence in that scene, I thought was incredible. Anytime we see him kicking ass, is just great to see. But he took on four people in that one as well, and just was yeah. I mean, just I mean, he's just incredible, and it's really really well choreographed and fun sequences like that are cool yeah and that, and that's they're developing mando to for us the viewers to understand why people fear mandalorian bounty hunters they can handle themselves in group against groups of people they you know they're one-man wrecking crews and it's it's fun it's fun to see him be able to do that i mean he got he got attacked by four guys he got ambushed by them and he still was able to come out on top yeah that's right so. yeah. <laughs> i mean even yeah even getting knocked off like that spear and wasn't rattled was able to wasn't rattle that. I mean, that armor protects you from a lot. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, we we see he got he got shot in the head in this one. Yes. But when they're shooting him, they hit, hit him right in the face, and he just yeah. you know, little head twitch and kept kept on fighting. That's crazy. That that armor. I mean, that Beskin armor is amazing. 
Amazing. <laughs> now, I wanted to... I wanted to bring this point up, kind of kind of tying back into my favorite moment. The crash sequence after the chase with the X-Wings, when the Razor Crest crashes, he's flying in through the caves and the caverns and he's bouncing off of things and whatever. And then he lands on the, you know, he crashes on the ice and he they fall through the ice and then he starts repairing and he's, he's pretty much able to take off until the spider jumps on him. And then he does a few more repairs after the whole thing and then he takes off again. It just, the, the Razor Crest can sure take a beating. Mm -hmm. And it seems like in Star Wars that ships are able to handle a lot of physical damage and still be flight worthy, still be able to fly, which is surprising to me because you would think a spaceship in space, in the vacuum of space, you wouldn't want it to run into a wet Kleenex because you'd be worried about what if this thing flies apart while we're out in the middle of the black? Yes. <laughs> no, I totally, I've, I've had that thought a lot that it can take. Now, a lot of it you can somewhat explain with shields you know every yeah. ship has shields so True. so they absorb a lot of it yeah yeah and maybe there's a shield around it that kind of you know keeps the integrity of the ship together but uh i'm with you i think that was you know the way it's damaged now i'm surprised he was able to even get into space yeah um yeah. <laughs> because you would think yeah it would there would be such a vacuum just I don't know how he's flying, you know, with a hole in his hull. And, uh, you know, I know he said he's pressurized in the cockpit. That's what they're sitting in. But that would mean, I would think the rest of the ship would be torn apart. Unless there's a remnant of a shield left that allows yes. it to stay together. He just can't pressurize it because there's, you know, too much gaps in it, I guess. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, hmm. yeah very much so. Interesting, interesting. All right, well, how about our favorite audio clips? Mine is when he first shows up at the cantina looking for Pelly to get some information, and it's the way she responds to him. Here it is. You finally found a Mandalorian and you killed him? He wasn't Mandalorian. I bought this armor off of him, though. What'd that set you back? Killed the great dragon for him. Huh, is that all? He was my last lead on finding other Mandalorians. <laughs> I just, he's so nonchalant about everything and she's like oh that is that all it's just, just kill a great dragon yeah just, i just found it funny there wasn't a lot of audio stuff in this episode really to pull from so i just went with funny stuff yeah that was good kind of hinted at mine earlier mine was when the frog lady tapped into zero and explained her situation and pleaded to mando which made him get up from his nap and actually get to work. I thought that was a, I actually really thought that was a good moment for yeah. our hero. It was. Here it is. My husband has risked his life to carve out an existence for us on the only planet that is hospitable to our species. We fought too hard and suffered too much to resign ourselves to the extinction of our family line. I must demand that you hold true to the deal that you agreed to. Look, lady, the deal is off. We're lucky if we get off this frozen tomb with our lives. I thought honoring one's word was a part of the Mandalorian code. I guess those are just stories for children. Right there. Mm -hmm. That, that so was good. the hook. Yep. <laughs> you know, that's the one thing we keep hearing in from last season, even the first two two episodes this season, is we keep hearing about people just hearing stories about Mandalorians. You know, I mean, even even Cobb Vanth said it. You know, so there's stories about you or history about you guys. You know, and he knew that yeah. they were warriors. You know, it's everybody he runs into. There's there's these stories of these Mandalorians, which is pretty cra pretty pretty cool to think. They, I mean, they almost have a similar reputation to Jedi, really. Very much so, yeah. If you think about it, yeah. Well, yes. And yes and no. I think at this point in time, you know, I think Jedi are still looked upon as possibly traitors. You know, I don't, that, you know, that's one question I've always had is at what point between Return of the Jedi and wherever, maybe, maybe episode seven. At what point do the Jedi maybe 
get restored as um, or known for being, you know, being turned on and not the traitorous group. Because throughout the Empire, throughout the dark times, you know, the Jedi were known in the galaxy as the traitors. They were the ones that tried to overthrow the government. Right, yeah. So at some point, hopefully that got restored. I guess at some point it had to have been because Luke started another, you know, Jedi Council, so Jedi Training Center. So don't know when, though. Right, yeah. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> some of the things we wish we knew. Hopefully they still have some stories to tell about these mm -hmm. chunks of time we don't know things about. Would be fantastic to know some of these things. All right, let's 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 get into our bounty section. Maybe we can find out a few things in there. What if he doesn't survive? He's worth a lot to me. This point kind of, maybe it was like minor disappointment for me. There was a lot happening in this episode. So many moments of danger. A lot of almost not making it type danger. And not once did Baby Yoda step up to use the Force to help them out in any of the situation. He didn't use the Force at all. He hasn't used it in the first two episodes at all. In fact, the only time I think I, I saw him use it possibly was when he was first looking at the eggs close up. And he puts his hands on the glass container. He kind of draws the, all the eggs towards him. I think he was using the force there, but in these, we, and we've seen him use the force in, in moments where they're just about to get killed. He steps out to protect them and he doesn't do anything here. And I'm wondering, is he, is he shaken up from the tumble still? Is he just too dang scared? Cause I tell you, baby Yoda was, he was scared this episode. There were a few times he was really scared and those spiders freaked him out. Cause when he was in the field after, of, of egg pods, after he ate one and they all started waking up, you never seen baby Yoda run so fast. He was hightailing it out of there, running mm -hmm. straight to Mando. So what do you think of that? Why is he just, he's just a scared kid right now and he doesn't, it's not instinctively telling him to protect them? I don't know. I, I, I mean, I thought about that too when, especially when they're in the cockpit and the big spiders, you know, my first thought was that definitely not that the X-Wing pilots were going to save them. My first thought was, okay, Yoda's a, about to do something. I mean, he's going to force choke it or throw it off the razor crest and then he's going to be able to take off and fly away, you know? Yeah. That's kind of where I was going, but, um, but it's true. He never did use it. And I don't know, fear may be the reason. Maybe he's so afraid he was, couldn't think about do doing that, but, um, yeah. He's picking, choosing his times, I guess. Cause he, yeah. Cause you, know, you think about that to the very opening scene when the, when that gangster had that knife to him, I mean, he could easily use the force then too. Yeah. But he's not, he's, he's not doing it all the time. No. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know what it was, man. I, I'm thinking it's just fear. He was a scared little kid cause he ran. Holy cow. Was he motoring through the snow there, which, which was kind of cute, cute and funny, but hurry up Yoda is scary too. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, all right. Well, that's kind of on the vein of Yoda, those eggs. Now at first when Mando and baby Yoda were told the story about the frog lady and her husband, and these eggs are their last chance at saving their bloodline. We see baby Yoda paying close attention and I thought he was looking at the eggs while listening to the story and, and kind of understanding the situation. Like he was, he was seeing the eggs as similar to himself. They need protection. They need safety. They're, they're helpless right now, but I was completely wrong. That's a big no, because all they were to him was food. He was looking at them as like your rating. Yum. <laughs> yeah. And he couldn't, couldn't get that out of his head about the food. And this continued for the whole episode. Which leads into my next point. I'm, I'm finding this a little interesting, and I want to get your thoughts on all of this here. I'm not sure if I'm upset with this decision in, in Baby Yoda's progression, but it's like they kind of went a little backwards to me with his development in this episode, because he was acting more like a brat and not caring about anything but his stomach. What do you think? Yeah. What do, no, what do you think? I, I think it's a very valid uh, question, because... If you, gosh, if you read the, the some of the reviews online, I think this this episode really mixed some Mandalorian fans up, and no. you know I, I'm in a group chat with, um, some you know some of the people that helped me contribute to Inside the Force, 
And, uh, and I think, you know, I'm talking about Hannah who does the beyond the sagas with me. Mm -hmm. Uh, She, you know, once everybody in the chat saw the Mandalorian, we started talking about it and she was the first to say, I do not like baby Yoda anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, cause she was very, again, like, like kind of what you're saying, confused on his, you know, his attitude or his, his, his behavior behavior in this episode. Correct. Um, because when he, when you, when, when there's that shot of him seeing the eggs for the first time, you know, it's this rock focus from him to the eggs. And, and like you said, when he comes up to him and you kind of uses the force and there, you, you feel like there's some kind of, at least I did, there was going to be some kind of, his heroic contribution that he was going to have. Like he was going to do something to help save them or get them. that. That's all yeah. I was thinking of. Yeah. That was the feeling. Like I said, it's like he understood the situation. Yes. Very much. Yeah. So. I, I totally got that. And I, I, that's the route I thought they were going. I mean, as soon as he ate one of them, I was like, wait a minute, what? Again, it goes back to my confusion statement. Like, I was yeah. very confused by the by the road that was taking, and it didn't stop. Uh, it I mean, he went, the very last shot was him eating an egg still. Yeah, he went back like three times. He kept he he oh, snuck away I after he, was like told he ate like no. a dozen of them. He yeah, he, the poor lady's last batch of her bloodline. He ate <laughs> half of them at least. <laughs> and I guess that's supposed to be funny, but <sighs> it. I didn't find it all that funny. I didn't find it all that funny, personally. I mean, the the motion of him, the egg is way bigger than his mouth, and he just and he sucks him in. That is funny, but what he's doing is not funny. Yes, I thought correct. he understood. I thought he got it. I thought that's the look in his face was telling me, "Oh, these poor things, like they need to survive." And like you, he's uh, he's going to do something. He's going to help somehow. Nope, not at all. Not even close. Yes, I mean he didn't he care. Is, he didn't. I mean, he is a child, so maybe that's the, what we're supposed to understand of this character. Yeah, that he's not fifty years old doesn't mean he has any wisdom at all yet. Yes, unfamiliar with what's right and what's wrong right now. But uh, just, but you know, you would think, yeah, that. I, I mean, I guess I don't know. I guess, Mando needs to probably feed him. Maybe that's what will make, stop him from eating everything because it seems like he just eats everything he comes across. Well, and that that leads into my next point, which I, I'll ask you in a sec. He, I mean, Mando does feed him. Do you see that scene with, before they crash for the night? They're all sitting down eating, and they all have little it yes. looks like TV dinners, and Yoda's just sitting there, just completely un, <laughs> you know, just so like it's true. Yeah. What what is this garbage? Like when he's looking yeah, at the yeah, eggs yeah. and then we see the frog lady lick it with her tongue and she's like, Bleh. So I guess I guess what he's feeding them isn't good enough. But my question for you is this running joke, because it's happened, this is a season and two episodes of the new season already, this running joke of him eating everything. Is that gonna start to wear out on us? This this joke. It's it's uh, like how many times can you try to be funny <laughs> with him eating something? Well, according to the reactions to this episode, I think they should stop it. Yes, because yeah, a lot of yeah. people weren't really fond of uh, of what he was doing in this episode. So, but it's not even the eggs. He went and ate one of them spider creatures too. Oh, yeah, it's disgusting, that's what I'm yeah. and he ate it. Everything. <laughs> yeah, you know, you think yeah, think back to the first episode with Quill, and he ate that frog. Yeah, you know, running around. I mean, he's eat, eat he's eating everything. Yeah. I mean, he in you know in the in the bar on Mos Pelga, right? He's looking for food, you know, when he's looking in that container. I mean, he's looking for food. Yeah, but he he was obviously happy with the soup when we first met Kara. He was happy with the the bone yeah. soup. So yeah, you know, something like that, I guess. I don't know, but I it, yeah, I think the thing is, is that this fan reaction to this episode is going to be too late because they might do this eating joke for the rest of the season. <laughs> they could. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. My last point about Baby Yoda here is that he does have a good sense of smell because 
when he went over to those alien eggs, he smelt them from before he left. When he was standing behind this pool, he turned around and you could see him yeah. sniffing. And, and then he went off wandering pretty quick to find them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The kid can smell. Good. I thought that was, I thought it was a good, you know, characteristic of him. I thought that yeah. was pretty cool. Yeah. That's all he got that. Yeah. But yeah, he's, he's hungry. He's always looking for food. Which is, I mean, he's just a tiny little guy. Where's he putting it all? I know. <laughs> Yeah, he's got to uh, he's yeah. got to be going to the bathroom a lot. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Is he using the 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 what did he call it? The he didn't call it oh, he called he it a something. toilet. Yeah, I can't remember what he said. He didn't yeah. say latrine. He said something else. But anyway, so let's let's maybe try to save save Baby Yoda's face here a little bit. I'm calling this point bunk time because I thought it was kind of cute and interesting that Mando and Baby Yoda share a bunk. We never knew that that was a bed for Mando. We had no idea. The only thing we saw that was is a closet that he hid Baby Yoda in before. We didn't know that it was anything, but that is Mando's bunk. He crashes in there, fully armored up and everything, apparently. And I I just wanted to bring that point because I thought it was cute because he he made a hammock for Baby Yoda that's hanging above him, so that's kind of cute. But for Star Wars alone, this is a thing. We don't often see beds and toilets and closets and sinks and whatever, but we were seeing them here in Mandalorian and also in the movie Solo. We saw a cloak closet for Lando when he was flying the Millennium Falcon. So we're we're starting to get these kind of things with Star Wars. And I, I wondered what you felt about that. Do you think that's, we don't need to know about that stuff or do you think it's interesting to get to see what it's like in the Star Wars universe? Yeah, I mean, I yeah, I read that in your notes and the only, th- the first thought that came through across was you know we do see Anakin and Padme they they share they shared a bed in episode three is when he had in a, a city he, yes in a city makes sense yes. yeah and of course yeah the Falcon I knew that there were quarters in the Falcon um, which we saw his bed and where his closet and all that stuff you know um, yeah I mean it definitely exists we just don't yeah we just don't see a lot of it um, yeah See, I don't think you'll see anybody going to the bathroom in Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, <laughs> um, uh, you know, and, but you know, one thing I, on the long, along those lines is food too. I feel like there's no one eats in Star Wars either. Uh, <laughs> you rarely see anybody sitting down and having a meal. You know, we did in the very yeah. in Episode Four. You know, when Luke's sitting there with his aunt and uncle and they're they're eating. She's cooking on the on the stove there, yeah. Yeah, and in episode yeah. one, you know, when they're sitting around with Anakin, they first meet young Anakin. There's they're eating some fruit and everything, sitting there. Mm-hmm. But anyway, it's but you know, in Star Wars, it feels like there's the meals are so tiny, like they're not uh, full blown cooked meals. They're just rations here and there, and portions, small portions and whatnot. But yeah. Um, Anyway, uh, yeah, it's good. But I mean, that could that could be just the that's just one of those irrelevant things. We don't we don't need is. to waste screen time showing you that people eat in Star Wars. Maybe that's just what they think. The same like we don't need to show you them going to bed. We don't need to show you them using the washroom because whatever. Do you really care about that? We've got plenty of other more cool things to show you. Then yeah, right. here's the Star Wars toilet. Are you happy now? <laughs> Move on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. That's right. But, but it's it funny that you to see the the bunk. Yeah, he definitely. Uh, has a place to sleep in there, obviously. Yeah, I mean, that, 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 see, that part was cool. I don't mind a few seconds of that. That, to me, is fascinating. And it, I, I'm okay with that. And I, you, you made me think of something. Ah, that The point I was, I was going to say is, speaking of eating, one of my favorite scenes in Empire Strikes Back was when Lando's taking the Han Solo, Chewie, and Leia, you know, to to dinner and the door opens and there's Vader sitting there waiting and that I mean that's my favorite one of my favorite scenes in the whole movie because it's just like whoa Vader and you know Han shoots the gun but think step outside the coolness of that scene and think about it they're all sitting down to dinner because Vader invites the men to you know join us come in how is Vader gonna eat yeah he's probably not <laughs> but and that's what actually, is he gonna eat but that's actually one of the stories in uh, the Certain Point of View book that actually comes out this Tuesday. Uh, one of the stories is the, from is the Certain Point of View is actually the chef during that <laughs> time. 
in Cloud City where he's like, what What am I supposed to make Vader? What does he even eat? Does he even eat? <laughs> so, that, maybe I caught wind of that, and that's why I put it in my mind. That's funny. It's funny uh, that you said that. Yeah. But yeah. That's one of the stories in there. Funny stuff. Funny stuff. But I was going to say, he doesn't, he doesn't even take his mask off to sleep. No, that's what I said. For all armor and everything. He just yes. naps in it. Jeez. Yeah, yeah, kind of. Yeah, the I guess that's fine. But man, he I don't. I mean, he's and most of the time, a couple of times he's tried to sit there sleeping, sitting up too. That's true. Just sitting in the cockpit seat. Yeah. Yeah. Like, good night. <laughs> he's just going to sleep. <laughs> man, at it's, some point he's got to just stink. It, you gotta imagine so. Like, come on, man! You can't wear that armor twenty four seven. Jeez. He's got to be sweating. I mean, and we did <laughs> notice that. I mean, I know he was in the middle of fighting, but, you know, when when IG took his mask off in, you know, what was that, episode eight, the the finale last year? Um, yeah, he's really, you know, he's sweating. I mean, he's all, his hair's all matted down. and Mind you, they did just get roasted by flamethrower. I know. So That's what I'm saying. He was in, in the middle of a battle and all that stuff. So I get yeah. that part. Could have been on there. All right. Well, let's let's talk about that last moment there when the gigantic Papa Spider. I'm assuming that because I think I think when Mando threw those three little bombs and blew up the cave that he's running from, I think he killed the the Mama Spider. And then the next one that stopped the ship from taking off was a different one. I think that was like the Papa Spider. Is my guess. Do you think? Do you agree? With oh, me really? That? Yeah. You think I, it was I, the same one? Because I think it was the same one, but could have been. I I think the one that landed on the ship was even bigger. Oh. I think he killed because when you go back to the scene when he blows up the cave behind him, that spider crashes to the ground and it kind of lets out a last uh, like a last breath of life. I think mm -hmm. I think he kills it and then this. Oh okay. And then the next one comes, which I'm assuming is the daddy spider. Yeah, because it, it, it looked a lot bigger. I think that's that uh, could be true. Yeah, but. So that moment, when that moment happens and then somebody starts blasting at it, shooting it off, and you, you see all these laser blasts and you're thinking, what the hell, where's that coming from? Did did you immediately think that's the X-Wing pilots or did you go, whoa, and how, you like, could it be, could this be a reveal? Are we going to get Ahsoka maybe? Like, what what did you think at that uh, moment? Yeah, my, my initial thought was it was somebody that, you know, lived on that planet. Someone we're waiting to see too. Yes, or or somebody he's gonna run into that was gonna again extend this story. You know, be part of the yeah. plot. So I'm with you. I I my first thought was definitely not X wing pilots that came back. It was definitely either somebody that was associated with the story and you know, somebody that was gonna help him, yep. or somebody that was you know. But definitely, I thought it was in some kind of inhabitant or somebody living in that cave as well. Yeah, and the fact that it ended up being the X-Wing pods will lead to your last point in our discussion here. So we'll hang on to that thought yeah. there. But yeah, it it threw me off. I thought, oh God, this is the reveal. It's, I mean, that first blast to kill mm -hmm. the spider, something's coming. We're getting a reveal here. And no, just lousy yes. X-Wing pilots. <laughs> lousy X-Wing pilots. Yeah. Like <sighs> Sab Sabine crossed my mind. Yeah. Like it, yeah. it could have been anybody, but ah, <sighs> all right. Speaking of Mando here, just a point, just a thought I had about him. He's kind of showing us that he's not fully swung over to the good side, to the light side. He's still kind of dangling in the gray area because you brought this up earlier in our discussion. He was willing to give up on the mission and give up on the eggs and give up on helping the frog lady. He was like done. He's like, ah, the mission's over. Deal's off. We're lucky to get out of here at all. And, and, and it, you know, and that and that was until the moment, which was your favorite scene, that she reminds him of the Mandalorian honor she's heard about. So I just mm -hmm. thought that was interesting that they're still showing us that he's not quite, he's not fully come around as I'm the hero, I'm the protector, and he may never get to that position. He might always stay kind of in the in the gray area. Yeah, which was a little, yeah. Again, I, the word I keep going back to is confusing. Yeah, okay. Um, it was a little confusing. Um, because I think, you know, when he makes a deal, he, he honors it and I, I, she had to be, he had to be reminded of it, which again, he came through in the end, but, but that's the same thing with the, you know, it's the same thing with the first episode, you know, he, he could have easily just killed Cobb and took the armor, 
but as soon as Cobb made him an offer, like, I'll give you it, kill the crate Dragon, and I'll give you the armor. It's like, deal. He honored that. He honored yeah. it. Yeah. Because he could have been like, what? I'm not going to risk my life for <laughs> yeah. for just that armor. I'm going to kill you and take it. You know, so yeah. so he's a, he is a man of his word. So when he made that deal to see him, you know, yeah, basically giving up and then he he worry about it after a nap. Right. It was a little just a, just a little confusing. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm feeling it right now. So mm-hmm. I get it. Now, I want to talk about one of my theories because I, I think it's kind of coming to fruition. It's starting to show that I might be on the right track here. That our main mission for this season and most likely multiple seasons, finding baby Otis people, is is the main mission. But we've got I've I brought up the idea of side quests, like playing a video game, like playing an RPG, a role-playing video game, where during the main mission, you've got all these side quests that come along the way. You know, oh, well, if you want information for your quest, first you must deliver the eggs to Frogman on Trask. Then you will receive what you seek. Like, I can just imagine an in-game video character video game character telling you that oh if you want this you have to do this for me okay go do that side quest and during that side quest you get another side quest and, and I, that's the feeling that i'm getting what mandalorian is doing I, I i posed this idea in our in our first couple episodes and i i i don't know this seemed like the beginning of that that this might be the way things go and it might be a one-off episode maybe this is a one-off and we got tons of great stuff for the rest of the season but i don't know are, are you feeling that too or yeah, once once you've talked about it and you know and and laid it out like that way, I, and what I read about in the notes here, I think I think there's something there. I think they're definitely side quests or quests that's going to happen. But um, my only thing was is that I'm I'm totally okay with that. I think that it's needed. I mean, we learn a lot about the characters, and you know, it gives them a chance to grow. But yeah. I, I, but I, I, I just what what makes this episode just different for me is that is that at some point it should take the next step forward a little bit more, and I, I just don't know where this actually takes that step. I, you know, we'll speculate it here in a in a few minutes, but I think that the whole mission right now, the whole plot of this season, which is finding other Mandalorians, you know, he's trying to get there by helping Frog Lady, but yeah. the, the whole Frog Lady part and crash landing and the X-Wings, that part is just, eh, you know, a little, it's a side quest, sure, but it's a quest that, to me, just it's, and you mentioned it before, it's like where you, where we have these throwaway episodes. And I hate to say that with, the Mandalorian because with eight episodes, you, you don't want to have a throwaway episode. You want no. every episode to fully matter. And I'm just not, I just don't, not sure why are this, why this one matters. Yeah. What out of it meant connection to the overall storyline. Correct. Yeah. Other I mean, than let's just jump to your point here about the new Republic. Let's, let's get to that. Cause I think we keep, we keep wanting mm-hmm. to touch on it. So tell me why, well, what out of this episode really gives you the only connection to possibly lead forward to our, our storyline? Yeah. And, and I think, and I think about the throwaway thing real fast, I think when you look back to season one, cause I, I guess some people can make the argument, Oh, you know, chapter five was a throwaway or chapter, even chapter six was a throwaway with the prison thing. I think, I don't think those are just because in season one you're you're laying the groundwork. You know, you're you're introducing people in order to catch up with their stories later. So yeah, you know, Pelly is Pelly obviously is one, but I mean, I think Fennec Shan was introduced in that episode because she will play play a role later. I think those prisoners will play a role later, and that was they were mentioned, you know, in this episode, and I think that's where. That's where the X Wings, I think they were, even though we were introduced to them in that same episode of the prison, you know, um, especially Trapper Wolf, you know, that's where we first got him. Yeah, yeah. I think that the only reason I can p- 
pull this out, the connection that they were in this episode is that at some point, I think the New Republic is going to factor into the Mandalorian. I know we're out in the Outer Rim and the New Republic hasn't really reached out there yet, but I think they're trying. I mean, that's the presence of the X-Wings are clear that they're trying. But um, I think we're going to get in more into the New Republic. I, You know, there's been talks that Maybe maybe a Mon Mothma would show up in this in this as well, or maybe some government officials would start showing up. Right. Um, I, I think there's a good theory that I've heard and we've talked about on with um, with some friends of mine that uh, that's possible that he could be tasked with with something from the New Republic that the New Republic is going to team up with him in a way or. Hmm you know, hear about him and, and help have ask his help to stop Gideon and stop the, his try to hit, you know, his resurgence of the empire or his, uh, imperial army that he's got there. So th- there could be something there on down, on down that road, which I could see. Interesting. Um, okay. And that's why, that's why they, he, that's why they brought up, you know, the captain brought up that scenario of what happened. Like, is it true that you did this? Is it true that you did this? Cause it's like, okay, well you did yeah. that. So I'm going to, res- I'm going to respect you and honor you, um, right now, but you know, don't let it happen again kind of thing, you know? And, but I think there's, I think, I think the word of man, this Mandalorian that's out there is going to catch wind with, within the new Republic. And then there's going to be something more there. I think you're right. I I think they were establishing that, that start of that connection here. Like you said, with the X-Wing pilot saying, Oh, did did you do that? You put these prisoners away and you helped us out. Oh, okay. Well, it looks like you're on our side, so we're going to let you get away with this one, but you got to follow the rules from here on out kind of thing. Right. They're establishing the connection. So that could be the start of that. Now, whether, I mean, whether that comes around, I mean, this is the second time we saw Dave Filoni. So maybe he's, He's the X-wing pilot that's that's patrolling this sector that they're in. So mm-hmm. we might see him a few more times, <laughs> which is so funny because he was so uh, f- you know flattered and out of his realm uh, talking about it in interviews, playing a actual character. Yeah, and uh, funny that uh, they put him back in there because I'm sure he was probably like, "What? You want me to go back in there?" <laughs> Well, wouldn't you? I mean, we can claim that we're as big of fans as he is. We just don't have the job he has to get to work in Star Wars. But if if you did, being the fans that we are, would you not make yourself a character in Star Wars and canonize yourself as a legitimate character? hundred yeah. percent. That would be it's like totally. a dream come true. <laughs> to come up with a cool name like Trapper Wolf. <laughs> oh, gosh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, to be a patron, because... Because all you got to do is be in the background in Star Wars because they give you a character name and a backstory. Like every person that shows up on screen or in a book or in a TV show, they have a name and they have a backstory. There's, there's, you are canonized. You just got to be in it. And you get an action figure of yourself. And you eventually get an action figure, probably a <laughs> pop figure eventually, you know, I mean, something. <laughs> It'd be cool. So fun. So fun. Well, one point I want to talk about here, Baby Yoda, one last Baby Yoda thing here, because it, it it was in, when they crashed on the ice planet and the frog lady decides to go wandering off to uh, find those hot pools, Baby Yoda's trying to tell Mando that she's gone. He's actually trying to speak. You could hear him trying mm-hmm. to form words. He's pointing. She went that way. She went that way. And he's, you know, he's like sounding like it, it's an emergency. Mando, Mando, come. And I, I'm looking at that going, he's trying to talk. I wonder, if we, we've speculated that if we're ever going to hear him speak, it might come sooner than we think when just based on that scene alone, how hard he was trying to communicate. Yeah, I agree with you. I think at some point he could talk. Um, maybe not this season, but I definitely think yeah. that he will start forming some words. I, I agree with you. Yes. Yeah. Do you notice that he makes this a very similar sound all the time when he, when he is trying to communicate, he does that. Wah, mm-hmm. wah yeah. Sound. Yeah. 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 So yeah, that's going to turn into something. His first word is going to, 
yeah. come out of that wow whatever that is mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> hmm. that'd be cool yeah yeah I like that so but I, I thought it was cute I, it was neat he's like she's gone she's left you know, he, he, he know what he was saying but he's mm-hmm. trying <laughs> yes all right now my my last bounty point here and i know i i've struggled to find some really good deep stuff for this episode but this one might might be our best one our best hope at a deep discussion here because it's it's a theory and i think this is probably the biggest disappointment coming from this episode because you when we ended the season opener you had all kinds of ideas about there being possible two or three episodes on tatooine with boba fett we're getting a full boba fett storyline this is going to be awesome. We were so excited and not five minutes into this episode, it fooled us. It pulled the rug over our eyes or pulled the carpet out, carpet out from under our feet, whatever you want to call it. Moments after last episode, this one begins and we watch him speed along into a trap, have that little fight sequence and then poof, he's off planet just like that. No continuation of Boba Fett's story, not even a wink, a blink, or a hint of anything more. It's just done. We've moved on without him. First, I want to know, this, I'm, I'm guessing this is your biggest disappointment, the biggest crutch of this episode for you, because it is for me. But could could our theory be right? I, I had a theory that we might not see Boba again till later in the season, if even at all. We, that might be all we get of him, like a Fennec Shand. That we get a glimpse of him. Yeah, he's here. He's in this universe. Poof, you'll you'll get him sometime. I don't know. But anyway, tell, tell me what this did to you by the episode changing away from Tatooine and Boba Fett. Well, if you if you remember correctly, I think when when you were going through the characters that could show up and you were asking, is this is this gonna happen? Is this not gonna yeah. remember? I actually changed my theory and, and said, you know what? I actually don't think Boa Fett's going to show up. The armor probably will with Cobb Vanth, but I had thought there's no way they can actually do it because if they did, they would have to really explain, you know, what, where he's been, why he, how he survived, and that could take away from the main plot of this season and the main storyline mm-hmm. that we're. We're going with Mandalorian. So, in all honesty, when they we didn't see him, uh, you know, and I, after I watched the whole episode, I was thinking, you know what? This makes sense. It, it's such a powerful story and a powerful introduction, reintroduction of him at the end of that last that last shot when we finally see Boba. It's like, okay, this is a major news. He's alive, but how is he alive? What's he doing? But that is such a big story that it makes complete sense that they're going to tell it in a different series. So that's a I, really good point. Yeah. I don't think he's coming back in this season. I do not think we're going to, I don't think we're going to, we may get him in season three or later on, but I don't, I don't think we're going to get him back until we see that whatever story that is that they're going to tell in a separate series with him. Because I think that's too big of a story to take away from what's happening in The Mandalorian. Which, in the end, could be my prediction. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, could, you, could, you heard it here first. And it makes, and it makes sense. Like I, I, Hearing you word it like that, it makes sense. And I, I agree with you, much to my chagrin. I agree with you that it's just a glimpse. It was just enough to tell us he's alive. That's it, it's folks. A, that's he's it. alive. He'll come back another time. But yes. we want this show to be about the Mandalorian and Baby Yoda. So just know Boba Fett is out there. And that was it. it which it, I guess is cool. But still, you're disappointed though. Because you we speculated after the opener, you were really hot to trot that there's going to be a lot of Boba Fett now because of that. We're going to we're gonna stay here on Tatooine. He's going to, we're not sure if he's going to work with Mando or fight him or what. But you were dead set that, it's going to kick right off. Boba Fett's coming. Season, episode two. Well, that and and it, yeah, and that's because we saw him. Because my whole yeah, my whole theory was that you can't show him because if you do, you need to go. You need to tell that story. That's that's not enough to just show him and then 
give yeah. him the armor back or he figures out how to get the armor or he helps him get the armor. Those are things, some theories that we threw out there. But as yeah. soon as you've shown, shown him, you have to tell that story. So, again, I was thinking, okay, well, they have to tell the story during The Mandalorian and you've got an episode or two to do that. Yep. But now, since we don't see him now, the, the now theories can... of it being a separate series makes complete sense. So were you disappointed, though? For after oh, this episode, were yes, you like, I was Dah! disappointed. Yes, okay. I was disappointed. Yes. Yeah. Again, confused. Confused that we see him, but we don't expand on on that cliffhanger in that sense, right? The cliffhanger right. takes us in a completely different direction and away from him. And but we get a, we get another series with him to explain it. Totally makes sense. And I think that announce I believe that announcement will probably come very soon. Well, so now that you've now that you've come up with this new theory after your initial disappointment, does that now save this episode for you? Now that you look at from a different perspective, oh, if they just show us that he's alive in order to spin off a new show for himself, then that makes me feel okay about this episode not having him in it. Yes, it 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 will. Um, granted, <laughs> over, granted over the rumors become true, right? Gotcha. So okay. Yeah, it, it will. But but aside from Boba, the concerns I think we've expressed in this episode still ring true yeah. about the Frog Lady and that whole side mission, you know. But yep. Yep. Um, but the fact that he's not in it, yeah, that was a little disappointing. Gotcha. Yeah, it was, it was for me too. All right. Well, let's see if our fans have anything better to say or if they're feeling like we're feeling about this episode. Let's get to our feedback. I find your lack of faith disturbing. He's speaking to you, Vizsla, that time. Yes, he is. <laughs> All right. First up is a voicemail from our friend X Force Eleven. This guy X Force, he is like a he's like like a racehorse of feedback. He's always first out of the gate. It's hilarious. Even is on on our Tomorrow's Legends podcast, we hear from him first before everybody else. So here he is with our voicemail. Hello, Star Trek fans. It's Jeff X Force Eleven living my feedback for Chapter Ten: The Passenger. I thought this was a visually interesting episode with the ice spiders and some of the battle scenes that we got. But story-wise, it was okay. It wasn't that great to me. I think it's just hard to follow up on the premiere episode and so we're gonna dip a little bit but i am looking forward to seeing what happens next and i am excited about this series and how we're following up on things but man oh man it would have been so cool if our two pilots would have gotten to see baby yoda and clear up some information for our mandalorian about about baby Yoda, but oh well, that would have been much too easy. All right, those are my thoughts. X Force Eleven is out. Ah, he's feeling what you're feeling. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, not heavy on the story wise, just sort of an action packed sci fi thriller episode. Really, if you want to nutshell it, that's what it is. That's what it is. I think a lot of people, again, a lot of people online are feeling that way. A lot yeah. of people. Yeah, yeah, I guess you saw more than I saw on that front, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's, it's pretty mixed. About I think half half of what I read really liked it and liked the direction it was going, and you know, seeing the new creatures and stuff like that. And half were like, eh, not really happy with Baby Yoda. Why he ate all those eggs? Okay, so all <laughs> I hate towards Baby Yoda, which I never ever thought would happen. I know. That's crazy. How could you tarnish that perfect, beautiful little green face? How could you? Yes. <laughs> Who wrote this episode? Ah. All right. Well, let's see what our friend Parashan has to say. I'll read her this week. She says, hey, guys, super tired. So it's going to be sh super short this week. No worries there. Always get it in. We appreciate it. Most nerve wracking episode ever, ever, all capitalized. Speeder bike ambush, so crazy. The ice spiders, so fracking creepy. Oh, she's using a 
a uh, Battlestar Galactica term there. Uh, yeah, nice. <laughs> and she says, Dave Filoni's Trapper Wolf has now become a recurring character. Yes, he has. We mentioned that too. We'll have to see how many more times he comes up. Baby Yoda was a little turd and troublemaker this week. Naughty, naughty, naughty. <laughs> I like that. Little turd. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, we'll have to see if they redeem him or if they keep going with that change in him. Hmm. Mando's grocery budget is apparently way too small. Baby Yoda needs more food. <laughs> yes. Yeah, those little tin dinners just don't seem to cut it. He was not happy with that at all. And then she finishes off. This episode clearly sets up for next week. We'll get to the wharf with the frog lady and her husband, and we'll see the mystery hooded figure from the trailer. Then it's a possible boat ride to some Mandalorians. My rating, eight voice modulators. Till next week, perish and out. Yeah, I maybe next week will be friggin' awesome. Maybe. Little little predictions for next week? Yeah, if if that's where they're going, I mean they're limping to the water planet. They're gonna be on the ship. We're gonna see Sasha Banks' character, whether we find out who she is or not yet. I don't know. I it after this one, I think next week will kick some serious butt. It should. It'll be it'll be at least interesting and fascinating with where he's going new locations and why they're on a ship all that stuff i think will be cool yeah um gosh hopefully i can uh hopefully i can find it really fast because i think they released um a description for or at least somebody found a description uh, i don't uh, like spoilers though i don't want anything given away well, I mean, it's not necessarily a description. It's a one line, you know, like they, use, you know how we were getting them all last year? Um, right. They were, there's just one line and never gave us much, but so do you want to hear it? <laughs> yeah, sure. Go for it. You read it and tell me if it doesn't give it anything away too badly. No, I, I think, it, I think it, I think it just summarizes what, what he's doing on, on okay. the path. So all it is, is it says the Mandalorian braves high seas and meets unexpected allies. Okay. Well, that's it. Cloaked figure. Yes. Sasha Banks. Sasha Banks. <laughs> and we get to the, uh, the, the, to the water episode. And so, it, so it seems like, I guess one easy prediction to make is that it seems like we're not going to get, Kara and grief definitely until at least season four, at least chapter 12, episode four, at least. Yeah. That's, so. yeah, that's true. Cause he, I, they won't be on this water planet. I mean, we, they weren't in the trailer. So he must go there, get some information, and then go get car and grief because he needs help. That's with, with yeah, the information. That's a, good, that's a good guess. Yes. I think that's, that's hmm. true. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Well, so there you we go, Kirsch. Yeah, we could possibly see Ahsoka in this next episode. Possibly. Well, you think, but they, they're going to reveal Sasha Banks. Would they reveal more than one character at, at a time? Well, it says unexpect, unexpected allies. So. Yeah, but that could be anything. Could it could be, be, it could be a, 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 a calamari character that just says, here, I'll give you a boat ride. That's true. That's true. Yeah, they, I don't know. They've been misleading us a lot, so. because, But I do think, I do think the possibility of meeting, you know, a, 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 a Sasha Banks who we think is Sabine, meeting a Sabine, meeting a Ahsoka, but then coming back at the end of the season to actually help and fight with uh moff gideon and stuff like that like that's that's i can uh, see that happening instead of meeting characters like that and they're with him for the next two episodes before we go to Kara and grief Correct. yes mm. interesting i think i i think their only purpose is to serve the next step like okay yeah. so we're mandalorians he'll get some information from them about jedi maybe and about where where he can go next, and then whatever's next might involve having to get help from Kara and grief. Right, that seems like a logical path. Right, yeah, could be. Uh, but 
so far they've been proving us wrong on our theories and guesses. So <laughs> yes, I'm not, I'm not putting true. too much money on that. Yeah. Uh, see the, see the speculation you caused Parish and just with your simple email, like, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Well, we'll have to see what happens next week. That's all we got for you guys for feedback. Uh, if you want to get on this show and be part of it, we will respond to everything. This is what you got to do. If you'd like to be a part of the show, you can send in feedback to the Mandalore podcast at gmail.com and also join our Facebook group. Otherwise, if you don't, we'll put a bounty on your head. Yes, and I had forgot to point it out, Mr. X-Force 11, we, we were debating off air. Should we Should we bug you? Should we make fun? No, we're just going to play along with you. you. You called this Star Trek. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I think because of that blasphemy, we're going to put a bounty on your head. That's right. <laughs> you have to pay us off or we're going to keep picking on that for the rest of the season. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pa- pass out bounty pucks to, to yeah. people who go track you down. <laughs> <laughs> Bounty pugs. Yeah, I got my fob already. Yes. I know where you live, X Force. Yes. <laughs> All right, good stuff, guys. Uh, don't forget to to uh, join the Facebook page and the you know our Twitter account at the Mandalore Pod. Vizsla's on there quite often, and I do a lot of the Facebook stuff. So you know, check those out. Yes. And become part of the community and all that fun stuff. Yeah, I think that's all we got for you this week. Um, I don't know. I, I hope I hope things pick up next episode, Vizsla, because I think I think by the end of talking with you on this episode, it yeah, the, the letdowns were maybe a little too many to make this one a really good standout episode. If it yeah. if there wasn't already such a well developed story and, and pathway for our characters, then this might have been a lot more fun. This would have been a good season one episode when he, you know, before mm-hmm. he had his mission with Baby Yoda or something. But yeah, it just, it's an odd place for it. There, there will be something that we look back and say, okay, yeah, that's where that came from or that that's why that happened because of this. So there will be something. I just don't think it would be that significant. Yeah. So. Okay. But I, I think the next episode is going to be a lot better, and I think uh, we, we, I think we'll, it'll please a lot more fans. Cool. Well, I look forward to it. That's all I yep. got for you guys this week. We have spoken. This is Cyber Ren. I'm out of here. And D Vizsla signing off. This is the way. The Mandalore is not affiliated with Disney, Lucasfilm, or Fairview Entertainment. This is a fan-made podcast for entertainment purposes only. All music and sound effects are solely owned by their respective properties.